Hello students, I hope you are doing beautiful mathematics. In this video, we will continue with our journey with number theory for mathematical competitions such as IOQM, American Math Competition, ISI, CMI entrances and similar contests. This is the second episode on number theory. These are revision videos, so you won't be able to learn the entire thing from it, but you will get a overall idea about some of the tools that you will need for problem solving. Today, we will be discussing these three ideas, Bezout's identity, residue class and modular arithmetic. I hope to share some problem solving strategies with you along with these concepts so that they are effective in the actual mathematical Olympiads. Let's start with Bezout's identity because it is a striking result in number theory. Suppose you have two numbers. Let's write down it one more time. Bezout's theorem. Let's call it Bezout's theorem. Suppose you have two numbers, A and B. I'll give you one example. It will be much more easier to understand. Let's suppose the two numbers are 3 and 7. And also suppose that the GCD of the two numbers is 1. So the greatest common divisor of these two numbers has to be 1. So in this case, of course, that works. The GCD of 3 and 7 is indeed 1. If the GCD is not 1, then something else happens. We will talk about that. But let's follow, follow along. Suppose you have two numbers, 3 and 7, whose GCD is 1. Then you can combine the two numbers. The technical term is linear combination. You can combine the two numbers and make 1. Let me write the English language statement first. That's how I remember it. And then we will do the math part. So, you can combine to make 1. That is the gist of this theorem. What do I mean by combine to make 1? So, you have two numbers, 3 and 7. You can multiply 3 with something, let's say x. You can multiply 7 with some other numbers, let's say y. And you can combine them. This is called the linear combination of 3 and 7. You can combine 3 and 7 to get 1. There will be numbers x and y for which this works. There will be numbers x and y for which this works. I'll give you one example. x is 5 and y is minus 2. See, it works. Because 3 times 5 is 15 plus 7 times minus 2 is negative 14, which is 1. So it definitely works for x equals to 5 and y equals to minus 2. But this is not the only solution. Here is a challenge question. Here is a challenge question. Can you find 5 values of x and y for which, for which 3x plus 7y is equals to 1. There are actually infinitely many values. The proof of this uses something called the well-ordering principle and mathematical induction. It's a beautiful proof. And if you are enrolled in one of the mathematical Olympiad programs at Chintak, then you have seen the proof in an interactive, the, the interactive manner. This is a very, very fundamental proof and it's very important that you know it. But this result is also very useful in solving a plethora of number theory problems. Let's see what happens in the general case. The general case. The general case is you have two numbers A and B whose GCD is B. Then the theorem says there are numbers 
x and y such that ax plus by is equals to d. Remember, in the special case, the GCD was 1. Now, in the general case, the GCD is d, any number d. So, I'll give you an example. Let's say you have 6 and 12. 6 and 12. This is a very easy case, but the GCD is 6, right? GCD is 6. Then, the theorem says there are numbers x and y, says that 6x plus 12y is equal to 6. In fact, you cannot make it 5. You cannot make it 4. You cannot make it 3, 2, 1. All the numbers, 6x plus 12y, all the numbers will be multiples of the GCD. <coughs> this is not hard to prove. So here is a challenge question too. Can you prove that 6x or let's say ax plus by, these numbers will always be multiples of GCD of AB. Whatever the GCD of A and B is, if it is 1, multiples of 1 means all the numbers. So you can generate all numbers. But suppose GCD of A and B is 2, then you can only generate the even numbers by AX plus BY. This is not very hard to prove. If you can prove it, put in the comment section. Okay, so that's the first thing, thing that I wanted to share with you. The next thing is the residue class. Well, there are two types of residues that you should be worried about. One is called complete residue. One is called reduced residue. All of these comes from a beautiful part of mathematics called group theory. Now, group theory is actually not taught in introductory math olympiad programs. But we at Chinta talk about it quite a bit in the advanced math olympiad programs as well as in the student research programs. If you are a student of Chinta, you should check out the student research programs as well. I have put the link in the description. It's a fantastic program for uh, high school students. A 9th grade to 12th grade, our students have gone to places like Harvard, Stanford by doing outstanding research work. Uh, I think you can enjoy that as well. So let's come back to this. The residue classes are very closely related to something called group theory. Maybe in another session I'll talk to you about that. But let me first talk to you about what is a residue. It's simply, you can think of it as a remainder. So, what are the residues for the number 5? Well, it's 1, 2, 3, 4 and 0. All the numbers that can become remainders when, at, when some number is divided by 5. When some number is divided by 5, the remainders can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's all. So, this is a residue class for 5. But, they are not only numbers, they are representatives of numbers. For example, 0 represents all the numbers that produces residue 0 or remainder 0 when divided by 5. So, 5 is there, 10 is there, 15 is there and so and so forth. All the numbers which produces remainder 0 when divided by 5 is represented by the residue 0. Similarly, for 1, we have 6, 11, 16. We also have the negative numbers. For example, here we have negative 5. Here we have negative 4 and so on. Because negative 4 produces remainder 1 when divided by 5. Negative 4 minus the remainder 1 is divisible by 5. So, so, similarly, 2 produces 
or remainder 2 when divided by 5. So this is 7, 13, uh, 12, I'm sorry, 12, 17 and so on. So you can see each of the members of the residue class actually represents a particular collection of numbers. In fact, what I can do is I can take 12, 16, 7 and maybe here we have 13 and we have minus 1. So this number set 10, 16, 7, 13, minus 1. These are also a complete residue class for 5. Because each number represents a type of remainder. Residues are very important in uh, elementary number theory. They come up in a variety of problems. We also have reduced residues. That means residues which has GCD1 with the original number. So let's take the number 6. What are the numbers that are smaller than 6 and have GCD1 with 6? Well, 1 is a number. Smaller than 6 has GCD1 with 6. 2 is not such a number. 2 is a residue, but it is not a reduced residue. Because GCD of 2 and 6 is not 1. 3 doesn't work as well. 4 doesn't work as well. 5 works. And that's it. Only 1 and 5. They create the reduced residue class for 6. So there is a... a very beautiful relation between reduced residue class and complete residue class. I'll give you a challenge if you can figure it out. A lot of beautiful problems are created out of residue classes. For example, Euler's Toshian function is a problem based on reduced residue class. Uh, Farmer's Little Theorem can be regarded as a problem on residue classes. So a lot of beautiful problems, maybe we can talk about it in some of the upcoming episodes. But residue classes are superbly important. Finally, we have modular arithmetic. I would strongly request you to watch all the videos on modular arithmetic separately. We have tutorials in our YouTube channel. You can watch them one after another. There are very beautiful geometric intuition between modular arithmetic. You know, just knowing the formula is not sufficient. You won't be able to appreciate the beauty of the subject. There are different ways of looking at the same thing. So modular arithmetic is definitely one such important area which can be looked at in from different directions. In short, A and B are said to be congruent to each other. You can put three lines like this. They call this congruency. A and B are said to be congruent to each other. Modulo some number M. If, what does this mean? This means that the difference of A and B is divisible by M. The difference of A and B is divisible by M. I'll give you an example. Let's say we have two numbers, 12 and 18. They are congruent to each other, modulo 3. Why? Because the difference of 12 and 18, which is 6, is divisible by 3. They are in fact also congruent to 2 mod. They are also congruent modulo 2. They are also congruent modulo 1. Any two numbers are congruent modulo 1 because difference of any two integers is divisible by 1. Difference of any two integers is an integer, so it's divisible by 1. No problem. So, we have a central idea of congruency. What we can do, the main intuition is, you can treat this as a division problem. So, basically, suppose you have a number, 12. If you divide it by 
let's say 7 then the remainder is 5. Another way to think about congruency is that this is the remainder this is the divisor this is the dividend so this will not always work but in some cases this is the situation you have the dividend minus the remainder is obviously divisible by the divisor so this this works in m many cases the reason modular arithmetic is so powerful is because you can treat it almost like an equality so if you have a congruent to b mod m then you you can do a to the power k congruent to b to the power k mod m you can raise both sides to the same power you can add a con constant you can subtract a constant you can multiply a constant you cannot divide that's one thing you can't do you can if you have two congruencies provided it's modulo the same thing then you can add the congruencies you can subtract the congruencies you can multiply the congruencies and so on and so forth it's a very very powerful tool to solve a variety of number theory problems I would strongly recommend you to go through David Burton's Elementary Number Theory for elementary problems in congruences so that you can have some practice with it. It takes a little bit of practice to actually do well in. Okay, I hope you learned something in this video and uh, I hope you will be able to use them in the actual exam. Keep on doing great problems. I will see you in the next one. Take care.